Wow. Wow. You know, I'm not sure what to do now. Uh, either let Danny keep preaching because he did a darn good job, didn't he? Wow. Uh, Tony and... T hey, can, can you all bring two chairs out and face them right here towards each other? Would you mind doing that for me? And... Um, uh, t yeah, I thought about I should change my sermon around to talk about change, but we'll do that another time. Uh, I'm going to talk about listening today, and it's going to be really important that we listen to God as we move into some changes, right? So that's part of where I'm going. If you could take your bulletin, oh, perfect, thanks. If you could take your bulletin and turn to that middle section called Sermon Notes, where it talks about listening well. And, uh, you know, you can read through that when the sermon gets slow, if you want, but uh, I'm going to come back to that. But what I want to do is, uh, well, first I want to say that that is not something I wrote. It's a quote, it's from an appendix of a book by Gerald Panis. Gerald Panis is an amazing guy who raises m lots of money. He's the guru on f fundraising, but it's the book called Finders Keepers. The way he raises money, unlike what you might suspect, is by listening, listening really well. So I want to give you a few scenarios here and see if you can, see if you ever have done this or part of this, because there's a lot of noise out there, isn't there, in our world. So imagine two people here, and so I'm going to say, hi, Joe, I'm Dan, and I've been here in Pasadena for quite a while, and actually I'm here for a year, and I'm just the interim pastor, and and then the response is, yeah, ich bin in Tübingen ein Jahr gewesen, ich komme aus Deutschland und uh, ich bin da in 1973. You ever had that experience where one speaking English and one speaking a whole different language? Like uh, Alabama. I mean, that's another language, isn't it, uh, Alan? <laughs> Are any Newfoundlanders here today? Any Newfoundlanders? They all come at 11 o'clock maybe. Oh, shoot, this won't work quite as well, but anyway, I'll try it. So we have a lot of folks from Newfoundland here, and so there's this famous story about uh, Jean-Pierre, who is from Quebec City. And Jean-Pierre comes across the border in Maine, comes into one of those little towns and robs the bank of $30,000. Sheriff Joe tracks him down, gets to Quebec City, and finds him and points a gun at him and said, you tell me where that money is or I'm going to shoot you right here. The problem is, Sheriff Joe speaking English, Jean-Pierre speaking French, and they don't understand each other. But this Newfoundlander sees this, what's going on, thinks it might be a nice opportunity, and says, hey, I, I know French and English, can I help out? And they both agree, and so Jean-Pierre says, hey, tell him that the money is down at the Frontenac Hotel in the back. There's a loose block. Pull that out. There's a bag with $30,000 in it. Tell him before he shoots me. So he turns to Sheriff Joe and says, Jean-Pierre doesn't care what you do with him. You can do whatever because he's never going to give you that money. <laughs> and for the last 15 years, he's been coming to Treasure Island every winter out to escape the cold up there. <laughs> At any rate, that's one scenario. Another scenario, you ever do this? Somebody's across from you and you're having a conversation and, uh-huh, oh, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, really? Oh. Anybody ever do that? Or, any of you ever do this? You're having a conversation and all your baggage is right here. A lot of stuff you bring to the conversation. Memories, hurts, wounds. And you get into this conversation and it's not really about the words that go back and forth. It's you keep unknowingly pulling all this stuff out of the bag. You know what I'm talking about? Or sometimes... The conversation is like this, far, far away from each other. And then sometimes there's something right in between. 
And there needs to be a whole lot of forgiveness and understanding. And then maybe the conversation is like this. I think you know what I'm talking about. It happens, doesn't it? There's no sort of understanding when you're not coming towards each other. So I want to talk about listening today. How we listen. We have two scriptures. First one is Proverbs 18.13. If one gives an answer before hearing, it's folly and shame. And the other is from James 119. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen and slow to speak. Here's one of our greatest longings is to be listened to, to be understood, to be listened to and to be understood. Have you noticed in our culture, in our capital, so much noise? So much talking, so much little listening, so little understanding, so much shouting, arguing, blasting. Talk radio, talking heads, Facebook, Twitter. All these things are wired to put out stuff but not receive. That's becoming the nature of our culture. You probably heard about the husband and wife who are talking. He was, re he was regretting that people talk too much and he shared with her that he'd just read that men use 2,200 words a day while women use 4,400 words a day. And she replied, that's because we have to tell you everything twice. <laughs> and he said, what was that again? <laughs> the father whose children were young adults set up this voicemail on his cell phone. If you require financial assistance, press 1. If you're in emotional turmoil over an impending breakup with a romantic partner and require a few hours of sympathetic discussion, press 2. If you're being treated unfairly at work or school and wish to displace your anger to a nuclear family member, press 3. If your car or household appliance needs immediate repair or replacement, press 4. If you're telephoning to inquire about our well-being or to pass a few moments of pleasant listening, please check the number you intended to call. <laughs> Well, there's a great need in our culture to listen really, listen really well. Listen to understand. Now, we can't probably change Washington. We can't change a lot of our culture. But we might be able to change us, as the song said. It might begin with us. And it might begin with me. And it might begin with each of us. And this sermon is for me as much as anybody. I promise you and my, I promise you and my wife and brother would probably agree <laughs> Uh, that we might be better listeners, then there might be this butterfly effect. Listen to this, would you? The gift of being a good listener, a gift which requires constant practice, is perhaps the most healing gift anyone can possess. The most healing gift anyone can give to another, for it allows the other person to be. It gives them a safe place. It does not judge or advise them communicate support at a level deeper than words. Have you noticed that in our conversations we spend a lot of time listening to ourselves? That's because we all have these memories, this, this bag of tricks, as it were, or these movies that are, and when someone shares something, it sparks a memory, and then that memory affects how you respond. Or most of the time when you're at, in an in an intense discussion or argument, the old adage is true. It's never about what it's about. It's usually about something else that's going on, something deeper. Here are three types of listeners. First is the fixer, the advisor. You listen with the sole goal of being able to fix the other person. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? to give them the best advice they've ever heard in their lives, and you're convinced it will do the trick, and, if, and when they take your brilliant advice, they will be fixed. <laughs> How's that working for you? 
And so you listen, sort of waiting for that brief space big enough for you to jump in with your treasure trove of wisdom. Here's the truth. Most people, most of the time, can talk themselves through their own issues if you give them the space to do it. It's probably true, isn't it? So it's the art of listening well. So that's the fixer. Then there's the moralizer. If you find that one of your first responses to someone includes the word should, you're probably a moralizer. Well, you should or you ought. How does the other feel? Or if you begin your sentence, if you just... If you start that way, just stop. Because... No complicated concern is helped by the word just. It's not just our words that impact our listening. If our raised eyebrows, our frown, our crossed arms, our rolling of our eyes. Danny said something to me this, this past week. Uh, we were with Brooke and the band that was practicing over in the Hamilton and and he said something that was, surprised me. He surprised me. He said, you know, people listen more with their eyes than they do their ears. Here's from the guru of sound, Danny. I mean, it's, I think he's probably right. They listen as much with their eyes as they do their ears. I may have told you that when our kids were teenagers, we had a rocking chair, an old rocking chair in our bedroom. And so the rule was that when they came home from a date or from being out, they had to check in first. They had to come and sit in that rocking chair and just talk. Lights were off. And what I realized was, boy, they just talked a lot more than when the lights were on. And I wondered eventually, not the brightest bulb in the deal, but I wondered eventually if I wondered if it's because they wouldn't see my eyes go in shock or my eyes roll or the, you know, the expressions we have. They couldn't see that. And so they talked with that sense of acceptance. How do you communicate? How do you listen? Sometimes moralizers will cut off, use the cutoff method. The other person finally comes out of their shell, braves this sharing of a feeling, and they're cut off. And then they crawl back in. If you want to stop being a moralizer, you might consider these, avoid these two phrases, you always or you never. And then third is the winner, the champion, where you win every argument, you win every discussion, and if you do, you're really losing the other person. You're losing the relationship. Understanding is more important than winning, and understanding requires listening. So now would you turn to the bulletin that you have there, the sermon notes, Gerald Panis. And now or when you get home, would you just either put a real check or a mental check by the ones that you do pretty well? And then when you're done, give this list to somebody who knows you really well. <laughs> what are you thinking now? Uh, and then ask them to put a check by the ones they think you do really well. It's a really helpful thing. I mean, I've been living with this all week. And I, wow. So I want to close with a question. This relates to what Danny said earlier. Do you imagine that the way we listen to God is similar to the way we listen to each other? Do you think? The way we listen to each other and the way we listen to God are parallel. It could be. Have you noticed in our day with the widespread spirituality that almost everybody talks to God? One magazine had a recent survey said that more Americans said they pray in a given week than work or exercise. Listen to this statistic. This will blow you away. Of the 13% of Americans who claim to be atheists or agnostic, one in five of them prays daily. <laughs> Did you get that? Are you there? At <laughs> any rate, so why are we so ambivalent about the notion of God talking to us? Because it's, it's difficult, isn't it, to listen, to hear God? I mean, I empathize with 
case in earlier. I don't hear God. Do you remember Lily Tomlin's line in the play, The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe? Why is it that when we speak to God, we, we are said to be praying, but when God speaks to us, we're said to be schizophrenic? <laughs> Why should God's end of the line be equipped with a receiver, but no mouthpiece? And then finally, in, God, in George Bernard Shaw's play, St. Joan, St. Joan of Arc, one of the religious authorities asked Joan of Arc, why in the world the voice of God never speaks to him as she claims it speaks to her? And she responds, the voice speaks to you all the time. You just fail to listen. So for the past three years, Jan and I have been trying to be pretty intentional in practicing Christ-centered meditation, contemplative prayer. Our friends who are here, Tony and Rosie Katarucci, uh, helped usher us into that. So 20 minutes, we light a candle, we sit quietly and try to listen, try to listen. How well do you think I do? Terrible. <laughs> about 90% of the time, I'm talking to God. I'm asking God for this. I'm talking to God about that person. I'm asking for healings. Here, my mind wanders. I'm distracted. But over time, I try to picture Jesus there. What would he say to me? And as we live into the future, collectively and individually. We want to listen to God. We want to listen to God and to others. So here's your homework for this week. Put this list you've been given in front of your somewhere and check it off. Look at it several times and just kind of monitor how am I doing as a listener. The world needs more listening. And then five, ten minutes each day whether you light a candle or sit quietly and listen. Listen, and maybe you'll hear the voice of God. Would you pray with me? Good and loving God, we do. I do tend to talk too much. I tend to tell you things you already know. <laughs> and it's hard to just sit quietly and listen. But we believe there's something powerful about doing that. Help us practice with each other so that we might listen, listen to the inner quiet breath of God in whose name we pray, amen.